what are the options available to Netanyahu given the domestic pressure to do something and the international pressure to not? Yeah, I think David Cameron put it really well. He said Israel sort of got this um, struggle between the head and the heart. Now the heart says um, a, a, a sovereign nation has attacked you, you must respond because if you leave that unchallenged, uh, what does it say? It says this can happen and, and there's, no, there's no consequences for it. The head says that the narrative has changed suddenly in the Middle East, that um, Gaza and the civilian deaths and this horrible destruction is sort of off of the, the agenda for the moment and um, Iran, which has been the centrepiece of, of a lot, so much violence and instability in the Middle East, is back in focus. Um, there's also been this coalition that, that wrapped around Israel and, and helped it defend against these attacks. But uh, it's very, very difficult when you've had 300 missiles and drones fired at you to just allow that to happen. And, and it sort of changes the whole equation also in the Middle East. I mean, the shroud has fallen away. For 45 years, there's been this quiet proxy war between uh, Israel and, and Iran. Now it's sort of out in the open. So, I mean, they'll weigh their options carefully. And, and with Israel, there's every opportunity that they, they say, you know, we will do something and say nothing because they, they often strike at Iran, whether it be uh, in Syria or in Lebanon, you know, its proxies or even inside Iran itself, just without acknowledging it. So we're just going to really have to wait and see there. Yeah, I mean, the tit for tat sort of risk is, is very high here. I'm, I'm curious because we've spoken a lot about Iran having telegraphed this attack very well. What's the risk, though, of course, that if you do have a tit-for-tat escalation, that the next time they don't? Yeah, that's a really good point, Annabelle. And, and I mean, as much as Iran could, you know, we're, we're talking about missiles and drones. I mean, it, it's not a it's not a risk-free situation by any means. But it had it had TV images of these things being launched. They weren't the fastest things that could go on. Um, Iran had made clear to it didn't obviously direct it speak directly with the U.S. or Israel or anyone, but to neighbours that had made clear that this was coming. It gave every possible advance warning so that these could be intercepted, so there would be minimum damage. It also sort of targeted at them at military installations. It wasn't looking to hit civilians. Now, Iran could do this much, much better, much, much faster and much, much more destructive if it wanted to. Uh, it wasn't... It, it understood, I think, and it, and, and it doesn't want to, to get into a tit-for-tat. Israel is obviously much more technologically advanced. It has the US behind it. It could really cause damage. And you also need to think of the, the Iranian uh, domestic situation too. It's not a popular regime. It has a huge number of young people. The economy is in tatters. It's a very, very difficult situation there. Um, so they can't rely on people rallying around the flag so much um, in, in this situation either. So they really want it to stop. It's just a question of, um, of what Israel decides to do here. And, and as I said, it's a real head-heart sort of um, debate there because logic would suggest that you don't do anything. They've won this situation. The narrative has also changed. The focus is on Iran, which is sort of the centrepiece of, of their opposition, of Israel's opposition. But, um, but the heart and this right wing coalition that, that Netanyahu is part of are going to be demanding, uh, you know, some sort of reaction.